And it gives me the greatest of pleasure to invite Professor Mary Riley to say a few words to you all before we start the question and answer session. But before she speaks, I have to say congratulations to her on being appointed as the first female president of the Association of British Neurologists. So well done, Mary. And over to you. Thank you very much. I promise what one thing that happened, every neurologist will know about CMT in the UK. So I'm just going to give a very brief introduction for 10 or 15 minutes before we do the question and answer session, because you've clearly had a very good update on from Mike Shy already this morning. But um, Karen asked me just to say a few words about the UK. So clearly, in terms of research, there's international research and there's the UK-based research. And I've put international at the top because CMT is very much something we are dealing with, as Mike said, on an international place. Because even though some forms are common in the world of CMT, it is a rare disease. And rare diseases like this will only get solved at an international level. And we've been very lucky in CMT in that both the charities, but also the researchers and clinicians work well together and have done for many years. So we will never solve this on our own. So I think in terms of the international research, Mike has given you a flavor of where we are with developing therapies. And I think critically what he's got across is there's a number of compounds at the stage of preclinical that will turn into being available for clinical trials within the next few years. So we're at that stage rather than a few years ago where we said we're still looking for drugs. So I think that's a critical stage. That means that one of the major responsibilities is for us all to be trial ready. So be ready to do a clinical trial if there is something available to do it. I think the other thing that international research has done is help us find the rarer genes. And I think one thing I wanted to say, Mike and I are a little competitive, believe it or not, in terms of recruitment. So, oh, in, right. <laughs> so in this international consortium, there are 16 sites. And the UK site, of which is one, has enrolled 704 out of 2,935 in the big natural history study. So 24% from one site rather than the other 15. The other big uh, enroller, of course, is Mike Shy. We're always having a competition to see month by month who enrolls much. So the UK is contributing hugely to the International Natural History Study, and to thank everyone here who are involved in that. The other thing international research has let us done is find rare cause. So this is a group of patients we have with a very rare form of CMT, and initially I had just one family. And what's very rare about this form of CMT is it's just your legs that are affected, not your arms at all and your legs are affected from birth and don't really progress. So it was a very unusual syndrome. So when I originally found the family in the UK, you can see the star here showing, um, showing the UK family, by our international database, which is kept in Miami, we were able to trace another family in Sydney, and then within two to three days, another family in Germany. So basically, within 48 hours of tracking this, we had four families in the world. And this meant we were able to find the gene very quickly, and this is a research fellow who worked with me, funded by the International Neuropathy Consortium, Alex Rosser, and then by putting all the families together to detail this in much more detail. This would have taken us decades before, and it took about a year. I'm not saying it happened overnight to do it, but it means those of you out there who come up to me at these meetings and said, you haven't found my gene yet, which is true, we are better at doing it, but a lot of the rarer ones, we can only do it by international collaborations. So what about the UK? So when we talk about CMT or any in hereditary neuropathy, we initially, what we spend a lot of time doing is finding the causative gene. That is the absolute first step. So the first gene for CMT was found in 1991. And as Mike said this morning, we now have 82. There could have been another one since lunchtime. They've come out so quickly at the moment, we just don't know. And then, of course, what we're all trying to do is develop therapies, but there's a huge number of barriers to cross before that. Now, Mike has given you a very good overview of what's happening in the science side. And I think we're comfortable in the basic science research that both in the UK and internationally, we're all working together to try to get this. So I think that's well-funded and it's working well in terms of trying to find the basic science questions. What the challenge really is now, as Mike has said, is to be ready to take this to clinical trials in patients in a way that will give us an answer. There is no point in doing a clinical trial if you don't know what you're going to find and if you cannot answer the question. So the question of, do we have the patient cohorts together? Have we got the right outcome measures? 
Have we got the centres that can do trials, etc., to lead to it? And then let's say we get a treatment. Let's say tomorrow morning there was a treatment for CMT. Is there places in the country that are specialised enough to treat the patients? Are there the appropriate clinics around for everyone that should have the treatment, have the treatment? And I'll show you this slide from the vitamin C trial that we were involved in, the one there's two going on at the same time, more or less, the US one, and there was the European one. There's no question if we did a trial tomorrow, we'd do it internationally. But when we set up the trials in vitamin C, it was still not possible to do a UK, US, European one all together because of some, you know, there's some problems about doing international trials. And I want to make the point here that when I did this trial with the Italians, there was eight Italian centres and one UK centre. Now, that's not because the Italians wanted to do the, all the trial. It meant that in the UK, because of lack of trained peripheral nerve neurologists and a lack of the expertise, there weren't many centres in the country that could do clinical trials. And if we had a trial that we wanted to start tomorrow, what we really want to be in the UK is ready to participate in multiple centres throughout the country. Because you can't have everyone travelling to London. It's not feasible and it's not desirable and it's not what patients want or need. So what I've done this year is think we're doing well internationally, we contribute the numbers, we're helping with the science, but I don't think in the UK we've done as well as we should be doing to be ready to have enough centres around the country that can both treat patients but also do the clinical trials. So what we have been trying in the last 10 years is to train neuropathy people up. So train um, neurologists who've been interested in neuropathy who can develop an interest in CMT. So in February 2015, we founded the British Genetic Neuropathy Consortium. So this is just a consortium of specialists in neuropathy. Now, to be a member of this consortium, there's very few groups at the moment. We want groups that both do basic science research and run specialised clinics for neuropathy, because they're the groups that will be able to do the clinical trials initially. Eventually, we will extend this to good neurologists around the country and good peripheral nerve neurologists who maybe just want to do the clinical trial but don't run basic science labs. So the founding groups are, this is my attempt at doing a map yesterday, so obviously we're in London. David Bennett, whom some of you know, trained with me many years ago, moved to Kings in London and recently, about two years ago, has moved to Oxford. David is an excellent peripheral nerve neurologist. His interest in inherited neuropathy is particularly in those ones that are called the painful inherited neuropathies. So there's a group of genetic forms of Charcot-Marie Tooth disease which predominantly cause pain rather than weakness. So he's an expert in these, and these are caused by genes that are involved in the channels. Next is Robert Rees, Rees Roberts, who's in Cambridge. The Rees is originally from Wales, as his name might give him away, and he also trained with us for many years, and he has set up a clinic for neuropathy in Cambridge, and his basic science research is involved with the rare forms of CMT1. And he's done some very seminal work in working out how one of these genes, SH3TC2, causes the neuropathy. So he is also involved in it. And then thirdly is Rita Hovart. So Rita Hovart works in Newcastle General Hospital. And the clinic there was originally set up by Patrick Chinnery, which was a, a general, gen, neuropath, a general sorry, um, genetic clinic. But now she has set up a Charcot-Marie Tooth disease clinic and again does basic science research. So these are the four groups and we've met for the first time um, to try to begin to set up centres that will be able to do trials. And as I said, that's the beginning, but we will also get other centres involved that have neuropathy experts, although maybe not doing the basic science research. So I think that's very important. And the reason for that, the first reason we set it up, is even though the first gene was found in 1991, the number of genes has escalated as it's got cheaper to find genes. And one of the problems is there's so many genes now that when we see patients in clinics, if they don't have the common forms of CMT, it's sometimes very difficult for us to decide which of the variations we find is causing your disease. So sometimes patients think if we do a blood test and get a result, that's the answer. But often we get the result and we don't know how to interpret it. So everyone sitting in this room, every single one of us have 20,000 genes. And every single one of us in this room have 500 approximately variations in our genes. But the vast majority of those 500 are just variations. That is, they don't cause diseases. They just make us individuals. But working out an individual, which of those 500 variations is causing your disease, is often challenging. So what we've done in the UK 
is looked, we have, for many years, we did the traditional way of just screening genes, but since we've been able to look at them by what's called next generation sequencing, which you've probably all heard of, we've worked out that other than the common two genes for CMT, that is CMT1A and the X-linked form of CMT, that 60% of the other results we get, we have difficulty interpreting whether they're causing the disease or not. So that's why these four regions we have set up in the UK have expertise to deal with this question. So they will be able to interpret the genetic result by a consortium and give the best advice as to whether something is the real cause of the disease or not. So that has become very important and that's available now. I'm going to give you a few other examples of what's happening in the UK. So the first one is what Mike alluded to a little bit earlier today. So one of the things we know from the vitamin C trial so we set that up as well as we could. We developed the outcome measures in advance, the CMT neuropathy score, and we did a placebo control trial. But even in the patients who took the placebo, over two years, none of our outcome measures were picking up a change. So do you know the way you come to see me in clinic and you say often, I feel a little worse in the last two years, and I examine you and I say, well, the good news is everything is the same, and you think, well, you're wrong. And you're right, of course, you're the patient. But whatever we're doing is not sensitive enough to pick up the change. Now, over 10 years, it might pick it up, but nobody's going to do a clinical trial for 10 years. So we have to find a way of picking up change as slowly as it is happening. So we have put maybe seven years of work into developing what we call an MRI protocol to, do, to look at where the problem is. The problem is in your muscles, in your legs, because the nerves don't work properly. And using a technique, which I will not go into, we can pick up the amount of fat in the muscle. Because when a muscle stops working, for whatever reason, be it the muscle or the nerve to the muscle, the muscle accumulates fat. And we have shown that even in 12 months, in CMT1A, the most slowly form of CMT, we can detect change. And just to translate what that means, if you did a clinical trial tomorrow in CMT1A and you used what we originally used, the CMT neuropathy score, the old version, in a group of patients, you would need 3,786 patients in a study over one year to pick up change. Using the MRI technique we've developed, you'd need 93 patients. So that's a huge advance. Now, that's currently under review, so it hasn't been published yet. We then have to make sure it's something that can be done in multiple centers. So one of the things we're doing now is introducing it in Iowa in the States to see can we do it in exactly the same way. And what we are trying to next step in the UK is try to introduce this into the four centers I've mentioned so that they'd all be ready to do it. I first of all wanted to thank CMT UK. This work was funded initially and is still being funded by the MRC Center. But we're now trying to follow up the patients more long term. So we're at the fourth year of follow up and the funding for year two, three and four is coming from CMT UK. And I think this is one of the most important things I've personally done in CMT. So I hope this will be very important and I'm delighted the CMT UK is helping us with this. So this is all towards being trial ready. So I think that's what's really important. And I think in the UK, we do have to do a bit of work on that. What else are we doing? Well, I thought I'd mention to you the disease that's nearest a clinical trial in the UK. This is a rare form of Charcot-Marie Tooth disease called hereditary sensory neuropathy type 1. Now, why is this different than normal CMT? Because patients have much more sensory involvement. And I know these pictures can be distressing, but patients with this condition develop, usually at age 13, 14, a dramatic loss of feeling. So they get all the complications of not being able to feel properly with ulcers. Some of the family members have amputations. And for any of you that have had ulcers, but for these patients, the ulcers are worse. And once you get one of these ulcers, it can be six months, a year, or two years to heal it up. So it's a very distressing condition. And with time, they do get severe motor involvement as well. So this is a, quite a severe form of neuropathy. It is slowly progressive, but nobody would say this is a mild condition. So we, I'm not going into the details, but this is one of these diseases we've cracked in that we know the genes that cause it, we know how the genes causes it, and for some unusual reason in the UK, there's a founder effect for the common mutation. So all of these families trace back to a famous family published by Denny Brown in 1902. So this is a very old family, and all the families trace back to that. So in the UK currently, um, there's about 75 patients with this. 
but there's less than 200 in the whole world. So this is an extraordinary rare disease, but it's a very distressing disease. I won't go into why, but we do know that using a drug called serine may actually be able to treat the disease, and there's some preclinical data available for this. This is typical of what was Mike was saying this morning. We have a disease, it's rare. We know how patients get the disease, and we have a therapy which we know is safe, because serine is something which we normally have in our body. It's an amino acid. So should, what should we do? Should we start off tomorrow morning and do a drug trial? And this is what real life is about. The problem is, there's two major problems. The trial readiness. We have only got 65 patients. There's less than 200 in the world. We cannot do a placebo-controlled trial. There is not enough patients to do it. So what do you do with the rare forms of CMT? You have to find outcome measures that are specific for the individual patient. So what we're doing currently is trying to do that. The second thing is, are we absolutely clear the scientific rationale for giving serine is robust, and I think not quite yet. So once you get to this stage, we are now doing about a three-year natural history study in the UK, looking at a wide range of outcome measures, including the MRI, including the skin biopsies that Mike mentioned this morning, to see which one will be best. And we're also looking at the basic science side of it to see whether we can get... Ooh, this has decided not to go on for a moment. OK, to see whether we can work out how the, how the serine might work. And really why I'm showing this as an example, although it's rare, is that people often, you know, quite rightly give us as clinicians a hard time while we haven't developed therapies. Or people say, I've read in the newspaper or I've heard at a meeting that this therapy is ready. I think ethically we should not do a clinical trial until we know the clinical trial can give an answer, be it positive or negative. There's nothing worse than doing a trial when you don't have either the patients ready or the outcome measures ready to get the answer. None of you want to go to the trouble of being involved in a trial unless it will give an answer. So I think in the UK, that's our biggest challenge, is to have enough centres around the country that are able to enrol patients into a clinical trial in the next few years, because it is now becoming urgent, when we have the treatments ready. The other thing I thought I'd mention is, one of the things patients often ask us, and I'm sure you've had the same answer, and the honest answer is, most people who have CMT as adults have damaged nerves. And the main aim of treatments we are developing, the ultimate treatment would stop progression. Most treatments we think will slow progression, but to date we haven't found something that will reverse damage to the nerves. So we really need to think of two things. One, what can we do now for people who have an established neuropathy, as well as prevent it deteriorating, what other research should we be doing? And two, in the future, it may well be that in many forms of CMT, we need to be doing the clinical trials in children before the disease develops, or in the older onset people before the disease develops. We want to prevent the damage happening. But let's not forget about the problems people have now, and I'm only going to mention a few of these. And the first one was the one we've done together with CMT UK. It struck me in clinic a few years ago that many patients, and I know London is difficult in ways because of the tube, etc. many patients tended to retire early because it became difficult to keep going to work. So together with CMT UK, and a lot of you have been involved in this, we designed a survey which we've done last year and we're just analysing now. And this survey was to look at work and retirement. And 300 of you responded to the survey. Interestingly, and perhaps not surprisingly, more women than men responded. Women are always better at doing these things than men. About 60% were women and about 40% of men. And we have to allow for that in our analysis of the results because work patterns traditionally used to be different, but we hope we're breaking that ceiling. And what came out is extraordinary in the first look at it. We have to go to the details. But the median age of retirement in CMT patients is 46 years. Now, clearly, that's in the people that have responded. And maybe there's a bias towards people filling in the survey if they did retire early. Whereas the population-based details for 2014 is that the average male retires at 64.6 years and the average female at 62.3 years. Of the people that retired early, 81% it was due to CMT and 57% of it was completely due to CMT and the other 24% partly. And 12% of CMT patients retire before 35. So what I think we'll be doing with this data when we publish it is bringing this to the government's attention. So why isn't there lots of money going into research for a condition that's taken this number of people out of the workforce at age 46? 
So this is where the health system and the social system need to talk to each other. So I think this is very powerful data, and this is the only kind of data that could come from a group like the CMT UK. The other thing is foot surgery. Now, a lot of people have an interest in foot surgery and CMT. And Mike and I have known for years that we don't know much about foot surgery and CMT. And this interest came when David Aparison in Milan that Mike mentioned, Mike and I were doing these training sessions we've mentioned. So we did one in London, we did one in the States, and we did one in Italy. And clearly in London we used English patients, in the States US patients, and initially Italian patients. And what was absolutely astonishing is when we did the training sessions, it was quite clear to us that the different countries were doing different surgery at different times, and that nobody knew who was right. And if you look at the literature, there is no answers to which surgery you should have, when you should have it, and who should do it. Every surgeon will say they're right. Surgeons are great believers in being right. And actually, you want your surgeon to believe they're right. You don't want a non-confident surgeon. You want a really confident surgeon. But are they right? So, and it was interesting when, I think it was Kevin this morning that talked about he had the surgery that was in fashion at that time. Because he's absolutely right, things go in and out of fashion. So what we decided to do, we took the 16 sites in the international consortium. So these are really specialized sites for neuropathy. So sites like Mike and Mike's clinic who see hundreds of patients at CMT. And we surveyed their surgeons. So I have my surgeon, Dishan Singh, whom you've all seen here talk. So we have surgeons who are very specialized in CMT. And we designed a survey with two very straightforward clinical scenarios. So one about a child and one about an adult and asked these 16 surgeons, what would you do with this patient? Only two pediatric surgeons and no adult surgeons agreed on what to do. So these are the best surgeons in the world with the same clinical situation, and none of them agreed what to do. Now, what that tells us is that nobody really knows the answer. So what that's going to make us do, so the first thing we're doing is having an international meeting within the next year to just agree guidelines using these surgeons and then to set up the questions that we need to do for the research for to try to answer. And we've started up a prospective study to try to find out what happens to people. So when patients ask us which surgery and when, we're very dependent on an individual experienced surgeon. We do need more information about this. Second thing, pregnancy. Now you would think with half the population being women, we might know the answers to what CMT does to your pregnancy, what pregnancy does to CMT, what type of delivery should a CMT patient have? Patients ask us, should I have a normal delivery? Should I have assisted? Should I have a cesarean section? What should I do? And will the baby have any higher risk of problems during labor? So we, you should know that, again, in the literature, there's some work on it, but it's in the mixture of many patients with neuromuscular diseases. We think that it's pretty safe in most forms of CMT, particularly CMT1A. Mike has done some work on this, but there's many different questions. So we've started up a long-term survey of about 100 patients to try to get some idea of pregnancy and CMT, because I think that's very important. I'm not going to talk about exercise therapy, orthosis, and falls, because we'll be here all day, and Gita, as you know, Gita Ramadari, who's our physiotherapist, has done a lot of work on this. But suffice to say is there are some studies going on looking at the different kind of orthosis. We have an exercise trial going on at the moment. And, you know, I think it's pretty conclusive now that exercise is not bad for CMT. Sorry, you're going to have to get out there and do it. Exercise, keeping your good muscles good. You can't make the bad muscles come back, but keeping fit is good. We know it's harder to do it, but you have to do it. I mean, we all find it hard, but having CMT doesn't give you an excuse not to do it. So I think there's many things that need to be looked at in terms of that, and that applies to people. It doesn't matter if we get curative treatments. This applies to people as it is now, and it's an area we've a major interest in. And also, Gita has a particular interest in falls, why people with CMT fall. It's not just because they're weak, but also because they have lack of sensation, and what should we do to try to address that? And I think it's underestimated, and certainly Gita's survey in our clinical practice found, certainly in the UK, People fall more in the house than out of the house. Out of the house, they're really careful. They put on their splints. In the house, off comes everything. Fluffy slippers go on, you fall all over the place. You have a glass of wine, you slip, whatever. So it's just, what, you know, why do people fall? So there's lots of very simple things we can do. So I would say, in my opinion, there are two major challenges for UK that we need to get ready, we need to get right, and we can do in a couple of years. First of all is, why are there only 3,000 people in CMT UK? Congratulations on having so many, but where are the rest? So I think one of our challenges, I completely agree, that one of the major, it's not just the money from their membership, 
It's to have them engaged. So I think we really need to work to get people. And I would say, we were talking this earlier, we need true GPs. Each GP is too few patients. It has to be when patients come to hospitals and see a consultant. Most patients will not see a specialised CMT consultant. But we need to be the default that when they see their first hospital appointment, they get a leaflet or they get the option to know about CMT UK. That has to become the norm. And if that's the norm, the number of people involved in CMT will be much higher. And secondly, we have got to get enough specialised centres in the country that offer clinics for patients with CMT or neuropathy. There's still only about 10 clinics in the country doing neuropathy specialty, never mind CMT, and have the expertise firstly to do clinical trials, but secondly, once therapies come on board, that can deliver the therapies to patients. And this must include good paediatric centres. It cannot just be adult centres, it has to be paediatric. So those are the two things I would say are most important in the, ne in the next few years. I'm just going to acknowledge the people I look at, and now Mike and I are going to actually do the joint session for questions and answers. So any questions that personally will come to me, I think we'd be better off doing the joint session rather than doing separately, as long as the boss, Richard, says that's okay. Thank you. Whatever.